Section 86 of The World War Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Street scene in Petrograd during the Revolution Photograph, page 488 The turning point of the Russian Revolution was when the army that has been stationed in Petrograd to quell any attempt at revolt went over, regiment after regiment, to the side of the revolutionists. For days Petrograd had been in the grip of a bread famine, the lines before the bake shops grew longer and longer. Ominous mutterings began to be heard as working men and students mingled with the crowds preaching sedition. Thousands of Cossacks were sent into the city to suppress disorders. But these were not the Cossacks who had so ruthlessly suppressed the revolt of 1905. The professional soldiers, trained by long years of obedience, had been destroyed in the war, and the men sent in to put down the uprising were lads fresh from farm and factory. The working men and their women cried to them, We ask only for bread. Would you shoot us for that? The soldiers hesitated, refused to fire. The crowd mingled with them, told them of their sufferings, and at last warned them over. Slowly at first, then with ever-increasing momentum, the troops deserted the government, sealing forever the fate of Tsardom and of the dark forces that had so long controlled the destinies of Russia. The scene shown in the illustration was one of the most dramatic in the revolution. The first entire regiment to go over to the people is shown marching up the Nevsky Prospect, on the way to the Duma, to declare their allegiance to the Russian Republic. Some of the bitterest street fighting of the revolution took place along this splendid avenue. Machine guns had swept its length, and spots of blood scattered here and there on the snow showed that, even though the soldiers had surrendered, Enough of the police had remained loyal to give the revolution its martyrs. End of section 86. This recording is in the public domain. Section 87 of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 15, The World War, edited by Horatio W. Dresser, Section 87, The Cost of the War. Estimates of the cost of the war ordinarily include such tables of figures that the mind is scarcely able to grasp their significance in concrete terms bonar law british chancellor of the exchequer in the house of commons december fourteenth nineteen sixteen stated that england had already spent nineteen billion two hundred and sixty million dollars and was then spending twenty eight million five hundred thousand dollars a day an estimate published early in nineteen seventeen put the total cost of the war to january one nineteen seventeen as sixty five billion dollars the cost each day to all belligerents being one hundred and five million dollars under date of october nineteen seventeen the mechanics and metals national bank of new york city stated that the war was then costing one hundred and sixty million dollars each day or four times as much as when it started while the total cost was put at a hundred thousand million dollars the mind can more readily grasp these figures by turning back to an earlier estimate and noting the details given in regard to several of the leading countries the statement is from the economist london the leading financial weekly of great britain december eighteenth nineteen fifteen the editor the expenditure of the united kingdom was one million four hundred and ninety thousand pounds per day for the first eight months or one million two hundred and seventy thousand pounds excluding external loans and has been rising rapidly since until it is estimated at four million four hundred and fifty thousand pounds per day or two million seven hundred and forty thousand pounds excluding loans for the five months to march thirty first next the total expenditure to that date is estimated on actual and budget figures at one billion two hundred and twenty two million 
two hundred thousand pounds plus four hundred and seventy four million eight hundred thousand pounds for external loans or one billion six hundred and ninety seven million pounds together these figures represent the excess over a previous eighty million pounds a year for the army and navy of the loans about fifty million pounds will be made to our own dominions but this is offset by the loan we have obtained from the united states we have more than all the other belligerents raised money by special taxation our loans to allies and neutrals are estimated to amount to four hundred and twenty five million pounds to march thirty first next and the burden which has fallen on us in this respect is doubtless more than twice as heavy as that of any other belligerent germany probably ranking next we have lent chiefly to russia four purchases in the united kingdom and elsewhere outside russia to france for purchases here to italy belgium serbia and certain neutral countries judging by the credits voted the war has cost france six hundred and sixty million pounds to june thirty nineteen fifteen to which must be added two hundred and twenty four million pounds for the quarter to september the thirtieth two hundred and forty million pounds for the quarter to december thirty first and three hundred and twenty seven million pounds for the quarter to march thirty first next making a total to the last mentioned date of one billion four hundred and fifty one million pounds excluding loans it is probable that the war has cost more to france than to any belligerent except germany special taxation of various kinds is only now proposed including in particular a war profits tax france has made loans to russia for purchases in france belgium serbia and neutrals and the total so dispersed in the first year was probably in excess of fifty million pounds while it has borrowed fifty million pounds from the united states and considerable sums from us the russian war expenditure has been one hundred and eighty eight million pounds including thirty seven million pounds for mobilization to november fourteen nineteen fourteen five hundred and seventy six million pounds to july fourteen nineteen fifteen and six hundred and thirty nine million pounds to august fourteen nineteen fifteen the seven months to january fourteen nineteen sixteen are expected to cost four hundred and twenty nine million pounds and the year to january fourteen nineteen sixteen seven hundred and sixty four million pounds making a total of over one billion pounds from the commencement of war the expenditure was at first one million four hundred thousand pounds a day excluding the costs of mobilization while for august last it was two million pounds a day and for the year nineteen fifteen it is estimated at two million one hundred thousand pounds special taxation is proposed including an income tax russia has lent money to the smaller belligerents but has doubtless received much heavier loans from this country for purchases here and in america and from france in respect to purchases in france italy which came into the war on may twenty third is believed to have spent eighty million pounds on preparations prior to entering and its expenditure for the four months to september the thirtieth last was fourteen million six hundred thousand pounds sixteen million five hundred thousand pounds seventeen million four hundred thousand pounds and sixteen million six hundred thousand pounds making a total of one hundred and forty five million pounds to that date belgium and serbia have been largely helped with loans by france russia and ourselves their power to provide being obviously very considerably curtailed the bulk of belgium has been in the hands of the enemy since the end of the first month of war an estimate of germany's costs has to be derived mainly from its votes of credit which have been two hundred and fifty million pounds in august nineteen fourteen two hundred and fifty million pounds on december the second nineteen fourteen five hundred million pounds last march five hundred million pounds on august twentieth and five hundred million pounds this month at the time the august credit was asked for dr helferich stated that the war expenditure was nearly one hundred million pounds a month to the above have to be added the ten million two hundred and fifty thousand pounds of mobilization treasure in the julius tower at spandau 
and the product of the defence contribution or verbeitrag a capital levy payable in three instalments at the beginning of the years nineteen fourteen nineteen fifteen and nineteen sixteen which was expected to bring in fifty million pounds to eighty million pounds partly perhaps because of this capital tax imposed before the war germany has hitherto not levied any special taxation but a war profits tax formerly said to be impossible to formulate until after the war is proposed to be shortly raised loans of large amounts have been made to turkey bulgaria and neutrals it is not clear whether austria-hungary has also been partly financed by the german government it is interesting to compare these statements with the usual estimates concerning the cost of other recent wars napoleonic wars seventeen ninety three to eighteen fifteen six billion two hundred and fifty million dollars crimean war eighteen fifty three to eighteen fifty six one billion seven hundred million dollars american civil war eighteen sixty one to eighteen sixty five eight billion dollars franco-prussian war eighteen seventy to eighteen seventy one three billion five hundred million dollars south african war nineteen hundred to nineteen o two one billion two hundred and fifty million dollars russo japanese war nineteen o four to nineteen o five two billion five hundred million dollars the following statement by the mechanics and metals national bank adds the cost of war loans to other estimates advances or loans by the stronger powers to the weaker allies and to neutrals have in three years extended well beyond ten billion dollars great britain has loaned more than five billion dollars the united states two billion five hundred million dollars germany two billion five hundred million dollars france eight hundred million dollars the responsibility falling upon the british nation in respect of loans is twice as heavy as that of any other belligerent but the programme outlined for the united states if fulfilled presently will make our loans equal those of great britain war costs up to august one nineteen seventeen of the four nations making advances to the weaker allies are given below figures of net costs appear in a column parallel to those of gross costs and are based on war credits actually voted and in the case of great britain and france on actual ascertained costs net war costs august one nineteen fourteen to august one nineteen seventeen united states two billion two hundred million dollars great britain twenty billion seven hundred and fifty million dollars france sixteen billion six hundred million dollars germany nineteen billion six hundred million dollars gross war costs august one nineteen fourteen to august one nineteen seventeen united states three billion five hundred million dollars great britain twenty five billion eight hundred million dollars france seventeen billion four hundred million dollars germany twenty two billion one hundred million dollars the present rate of war expenditure by the united states based on recent administration statements may be placed at a higher figure than that of any other nation engaged in the hostilities every day the direct military cost is twenty nine million four hundred thousand dollars and in addition loans to our allies are at a rate that makes the total gross daily war cost for the united states more than forty million dollars great britain has a total daily war cost of thirty nine million dollars gross germany is spending not far from thirty million dollars a day and france is spending twenty one million dollars for these nations the figures include advances to allies the united states has extended credit for the purchase of military supplies to great britain france russia belgium serbia and italy great britain has loaned funds to russia france italy belgium roumania and certain neutral countries france has made advances to russia belgium and serbia germany has extended assistance to austria hungary turkey and bulgaria and it is said to greece on a daily basis the four nations are making current payments about as follows gross costs it must be kept in mind are direct military costs plus foreign loans or advances present daily net war cost 
united states twenty nine million four hundred thousand dollars great britain thirty five million dollars germany twenty seven million two hundred thousand dollars france twenty million two hundred thousand dollars present daily gross war cost united states forty million three hundred and sixty thousand dollars great britain thirty nine million dollars germany thirty million dollars france twenty one million dollars the cost of the war averages three dollars daily for each soldier enlisted total daily expenses of all the allies are one hundred and fifteen million dollars as compared with forty three million dollars for the central powers the ratio being two and a half to one the disparity is explained by the different conditions under which the embattled groups are fighting by the need of the allies to spend large sums in keeping their navies and mercantile fleets at sea by the different system of pay in the armies by manufacture and transportation war's money is now largely expended in the laboratory the foundry and the machine shop and in the cause of the allies an important part is expended in costly steamship and railway transportation end of section eighty seven this recording is in the public domain section eighty eight of the world war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume fifteen the world war edited by horatio w dresser section eighty eight the human cost an estimate published by the economist london december nineteen fifteen puts the losses to that time as follows united kingdom eight hundred thousand france two million russia five million italy five hundred thousand belgium and serbia five hundred and fifty thousand total for the entente allies killed wounded and missing eight million eight hundred and fifty thousand of this number two million were said to be killed dead from disease or permanently incapacitated the central powers to that time had lost seven million four hundred thousand of which one million nine hundred and eighty thousand were killed dead from disease or permanently disabled according to estimates published by the war department at washington october twenty two nineteen seventeen at least thirty eight million were then under arms twenty seven million five hundred thousand on the side of the allies and ten million six hundred thousand on the side of the central powers these figures do not include the naval strength which would raise the total several millions the table on page five o seven represents the total enlistment from the beginning it was compiled by the mechanics and metals national bank from whose cost of the war the following general statement is taken the editor it is impossible to compute accurately the human lives that have been sacrificed since the beginning of the war all the belligerent nations forbear to make public the wastage of men and private attempts are highly speculative and subject to serious gaps however that the number of slain had run into millions was a general assumption in the very first year of the war having read daily of campaigns of vast armies of attacks of infantry in mass formation of great guns hurling projectiles weighing thousands of pounds of terrific and long-continued bombardments of sweeping fogs of poison gases of death rained from the sky and dealt from beneath the sea having read all of these things the world recognized long ago that the war had taken an appalling total of human life the number of men engaged in hostilities shows how vast is the war and from what a large supply the casualties have come the numbers called to the colors of the various nations have been roughly as follows men enlisted united states two million british empire seven million five hundred thousand france six million russia fourteen million 
italy two million five hundred thousand belgium serbia and portugal one million entente allies thirty three million germany ten million five hundred thousand austria hungary seven million bulgaria five hundred thousand turkey two million teutonic allies twenty million total all fifty three million of this fifty three million representing able-bodied and skilful workmen possibly a fourth can be said to have been killed or injured since the outbreak of the war the stage of the war and the performance have been so gigantic that deaths in the first three years of hostilities were in the neighborhood of seven million while injuries leaving men invalids were more than five million this means to use a familiar comparison that a number of men equal to one-eighth the population of the united states suffered death or permanent injury in the first three years of the war the killed equaled seven per cent of our population the maimed equaled five per cent the total of killed as a matter of fact has in the elapsed period of the war equaled the full number of men called to the colors by the british empire it has exceeded the number of the whole french army and has been four times as great as the number of men now enlisted under the american flag the total of killed and permanently wounded has reached an amount greater than the enlisted number of any single nation except russia and even the fourteen million total of that nation is being crowded by the records of casualties while total figures by themselves are large the actual death rate indicated by the mortality records of the war is not more than forty five per one thousand per annum thus the loss of life has been about one in twenty two each year referring to single campaigns on the western front the committee on public information at washington recently made the statement that figures taken when the casualties were greatest in proportion to mobilized strength and combined with the highest proportion of deaths show losses due to deaths from wounds and killed in action to be approximately eleven in every thousand of mobilized strength the statement added that the high-water mark of total casualties in the french army was reached early in the war at the battles of charleroi and the marne in that period they were five point four one per cent of the mobilized strength statistics are often dry as dust but when measuring the carnage of war they register one of the most tragic calamities of all history the nearest approach to the human sacrifice of this war is contained in the record of the napoleonic wars which extended over more than twenty years and took toll altogether of two million one hundred thousand lives compilations made by the war study society of copenhagen from such information and statistics as could be secured showed that in the first two years of the hostilities august one nineteen fourteen to august one nineteen sixteen more than four million six hundred thousand deaths occurred in all the armies engaged while eleven million two hundred thousand soldiers were wounded a third of them being made permanent invalids we present below a table estimating for three years to august one nineteen seventeen the loss of life among soldiers to the different countries engaged in the war based on the society's figures the first column contains the list of dead in the first two years of the war as estimated by the society the second column contains an approximation of the deaths of the third year of the war the figures being arrived at by assuming that the casualties of the third year were at the same rate as those of the first two years this basis of calculation is neither accurate nor satisfactory but without official figures it at least gives some conception of war's destruction of life two years august one nineteen fourteen to august one nineteen sixteen dead england two hundred and five thousand france eight hundred and fifty five thousand russia one million five hundred thousand italy one hundred and five thousand belgium fifty thousand serbia one hundred and ten thousand romania blank entente allies two million eight hundred and twenty five thousand germany eight hundred and eighty five thousand austria hungary seven hundred and eighteen thousand turkey one hundred and fifty thousand bulgaria twenty five thousand teutonic allies one million seven hundred and seventy eight thousand total all four million six hundred and three thousand one year august one nineteen sixteen to august one nineteen seventeen dead england one hundred and two thousand five hundred 
france four hundred and twenty seven thousand five hundred russia seven hundred and fifty thousand italy fifty two thousand belgium twenty five thousand serbia fifty five thousand roumania one hundred thousand entente allies one million five hundred and twelve thousand germany four hundred and forty two thousand five hundred austria hungary three hundred and fifty nine thousand turkey seventy five thousand bulgaria twelve thousand five hundred teutonic allies eight hundred and eighty nine thousand total all two million four hundred and one thousand total three years dead england three hundred and seven thousand five hundred france one million two hundred and eighty two thousand five hundred russia two million two hundred and fifty thousand italy one hundred and fifty seven thousand five hundred belgium seventy five thousand serbia one hundred and sixty five thousand roumania one hundred thousand entente allies four million three hundred and thirty seven thousand germany one million three hundred and twenty seven thousand five hundred austria hungary one million seventy seven thousand turkey two hundred and twenty five thousand bulgaria thirty seven thousand five hundred teutonic allies two million six hundred and sixty seven thousand total all seven million four thousand one reason for the wide margin between the losses of the entente allies and the central powers is the relative unpreparedness of the entente at the beginning of the war the disastrous retreat of france in nineteen fourteen and of russia later from the mazurian lakes and the carpathians and in roumania france suffered tremendously in its early retreat to the marne and later in its defence of verdun because it is fighting on interior lines without suffering disastrous retreats and because of a highly efficient medical service germany has suffered relatively less than some of the other nations notwithstanding that her offensives on various fronts have led her into heavy losses in dead nearly one-third of her casualties are estimated to have been suffered around verdun russia has been the heaviest loser in manpower its total of loss in deaths injuries and prisoners being nearly double that of any other nation austria hungary also has been a heavy sufferer in regard to the losses for russia and austria hungary the great campaigns in the east are to be considered these having been carried on by large forces in the open over wide stretches of territory lack of communication and hospital facilities also have been a factor england's losses have been smaller than those of the other european powers owing to the time required to bring her full strength to bear in the war theatre italy until recently was saved from extreme casualties through the confining of open operations on her mountain frontiers roumania although entering the war late suffered disastrously by reason of germany's invasion belgium and serbia the two small states overrun by the german machine early in the war lost heavily in proportion to population turkey has been a heavy loser through waging war on a wide sweep of front from gallipoli through syria arabia mesopotamia and armenia bulgaria has been relatively a small loser the number of men wounded in the war can only be roughly estimated many of the wounded are regarded as so slightly hurt that no reckoning of them is made in casualty lists many are wounded a number of times and their reckoning confuses the figures more than five million men have been made permanent invalids in the three elapsed years of war however the accompanying table shows the number of the permanently injured figures in the first column showing the returns of the war study society of copenhagen for the first two years being made the basis for the estimates of the third year on the basis of a like yearly average two years august one nineteen fourteen to august one nineteen sixteen permanently wounded england one hundred and fifty four thousand france six hundred and thirty four thousand russia one million one hundred and forty six thousand italy seventy three thousand belgium thirty three thousand serbia forty two thousand roumania blank entente allies two million eighty two thousand germany six hundred and thirty five thousand austria hungary five hundred and thirty three thousand turkey one hundred and five thousand bulgaria eighteen thousand teutonic allies one million two hundred and ninety one thousand total all three million three hundred and seventy three thousand one year august one nineteen sixteen to august one nineteen seventeen permanently wounded england seventy seven thousand france three hundred and seventeen thousand russia five hundred and seventy three thousand italy thirty seven thousand belgium sixteen thousand serbia twenty one thousand roumania sixty thousand entente allies one million one hundred and one thousand 
germany three hundred and eighteen thousand austria hungary two hundred and sixty six thousand turkey fifty two thousand bulgaria nine thousand teutonic allies six hundred and forty five thousand total one million seven hundred and forty six thousand total three years permanently wounded england two hundred and thirty one thousand france nine hundred and fifty one thousand russia one million seven hundred and nineteen thousand italy one hundred and ten thousand belgium forty nine thousand serbia sixty three thousand roumania sixty thousand entente allies three million one hundred and eighty three thousand germany nine hundred and fifty three thousand austria hungary seven hundred and ninety nine thousand turkey one hundred and fifty seven thousand bulgaria twenty seven thousand teutonic allies one million nine hundred and thirty six thousand total all five million one hundred and nineteen thousand military experts agree that the killed in action and dead of wounds have never at any time in the war exceeded twenty per cent of the total casualties End of section eighty eight this recording is in the public domain section eighty nine of the world war read for LibriVox .org by todd the world war part fifteen the entrance of the united states historical note on the thirty first of january nineteen seventeen count von bernstoff german ambassador to the united states handed to mr lansing secretary of state a note in which his government announced its purpose to carry into full effect the ruthless submarine policy against which the government of the united states had been protesting the announcement declared that a prohibited zone had been mapped out by germany bordering holland england and france and including portions of the mediterranean and that on and after the next day february first ships of any nation from any port would be sunk without warning save that for one american vessel a week carrying passengers only a safety zone would be established enabling this ship to pass to and from a designated english port in safety in response to this decree the government of the united states severed diplomatic relations with germany february third by dismissing count von bernstorff giving him his passports and recalling the american ambassador james w gerard from berlin on the same day president wilson addressed both houses of congress and announced the complete severance of relations between the united states and germany the policy adopted by the government for the time being was that of armed neutrality and it was proposed to equip merchant ships to meet their foes the german submarines during the interval while this policy was under discussion it became plain that the german government was determined to make good its threats and on march twelfth orders were issued to place armed guards on american merchant ships this temporary policy came to an end with the address of president wilson to congress april second in which he asked congress to declare the existence of a state of war with germany on april sixth the house of representatives passed a vote accepting the joint resolution which had already passed the senate and war was formally declared End of section 89. This recording is in the public domain. Section 90 of The World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 15. The World War, edited by Horatio W. Dresser, Section 90, The War Message, 1917, by Woodrow Wilson. I have called the Congress into extraordinary session because there are serious, very serious, choices of policy to be made, and made immediately, which it was neither right nor constitutionally permissible that I should assume the responsibility of making. On the 3rd of February last, I officially laid before you the extraordinary announcement of the Imperial German Government that on and after the first day of February, it was its purpose to put aside all restraints of law or of humanity and use its submarines to sink every vessel that sought to approach either the ports of Great Britain or Ireland or the western coasts of Europe or any of the ports controlled by the enemies of Germany within the Mediterranean. That had seemed to be the object of the German submarine warfare earlier in the year, 
but since April of last year, the Imperial Government had somewhat restrained the commanders of its undersea craft in conformity with its promise, then given to us, that passenger boats should not be sunk, and that due warning would be given to all other vessels which its submarines might seek to destroy, when no resistance was offered or escape attempted, and care taken that their crews were given at least a fair chance to save their lives in their open boats. The precautions taken were meager and haphazard enough, as was proved in distressing instance after instance in the progress of the cruel and unmanly business, but a certain degree of restraint was observed. The new policy has swept every restriction aside. Vessels of every kind, whatever their flag, their character, their cargo, their destination, their errand, have been ruthlessly sent to the bottom without warning and without thought of help or mercy for those on board, the vessels of friendly neutrals, along with those of belligerents. Even hospital ships and ships carrying relief to the sorely bereaved and stricken people of Belgium, though the latter were provided with safe conduct through the prescribed areas by the German government itself, and were distinguished by unmistakable marks of identity, have been sunk with the same reckless lack of compassion or of principle. I was, for a little while, unable to believe that such things would in fact be done by any government that had hitherto subscribed to the humane practices of civilized nations. International law had its origin in the attempt to set up some law which would be respected and observed upon the seas where no nation had right of dominion, and where lay the free highways of the world. By painful stage after stage has that law been built up, with meager enough results indeed, after all was accomplished that could be accomplished, but always with a clear view at least of what the heart and conscience of mankind demanded. This minimum of right the German government has swept aside, under the plea of retaliation and necessity, and because it had no weapons which it could use at sea except these, which it is impossible to employ, as it is employing them without throwing to the winds all the scruples of humanity or of respect for the understandings that were supposed to underlie the intercourse of the world. I am not now thinking of the loss of property involved, immense and serious as that is, but only of the wanton and wholesale destruction of the lives of non-combatants, men, women, and children, engaged in pursuits which have always, even in the darkest periods of modern history, been deemed innocent and legitimate. Property can be paid for, the lives of peaceful and innocent people cannot be. The present German submarine warfare against commerce is a warfare against mankind. It is a war against all nations. American ships have been sunk, American lives taken, in ways which it has stirred us very deeply to learn of. But the ships and people of other neutral and friendly nations have been sunk and overwhelmed in the waters in the same way. There has been no discrimination. The challenge is to all mankind. Each nation must decide for itself how it will meet it. The choice we make for ourselves must be made with a moderation of counsel and a temperateness of judgment befitting our character and our motives as a nation. We must put excited feeling away. Our motive will not be revenge or the victorious assertion of the physical might of the nation, but only the vindication of right, of human right, of which we are only a single champion. When I addressed the Congress on the 26th of February last, I thought that it would suffice to assert our neutral rights with arms, our right to use the seas against unlawful interference, our right to keep our people safe against unlawful violence. But armed neutrality, it now appears, is impracticable. Because submarines are, in effect, outlaws when used as the German submarines have been used against merchant shipping, it is impossible to defend ships against their attacks, as the law of nations has assumed that merchantmen would defend themselves against privateers or cruisers, visible craft giving chase upon the open sea. It is common prudence in such circumstances, grim necessity, indeed, to endeavor to destroy them before they have shown their own intention. They must be dealt with upon sight, if dealt with at all. The German government denies the right of neutrals to use arms at all within the areas of the sea which it has proscribed, even in the defense of rights which no modern publicist has ever before questioned the right to defend. The intimation is conveyed that the armed guards which we have placed on our merchant ships will be treated as beyond the pale of law, and subject to be dealt with as pirates would be. Armed neutrality is ineffectual enough at best. In such circumstances, and in the face of such pretensions, it is worse than ineffectual. It is likely only to produce what it was meant to prevent. It is practically certain to draw us into the war without either the rights or the effectiveness of belligerents. There is one choice we cannot make we are incapable of making. 
we will not choose the path of submission and suffer the most sacred rights of our nation and our people to be ignored or violated. The wrongs against which we now array ourselves are no common wrongs. They cut to the very roots of human life. With a profound sense of the solemn and even tragical character of the step I am taking, and of the grave responsibilities which it involves, but in unhesitating obedience to what I deem my constitutional duty, I advise that the Congress declare the recent course of the Imperial German government to be, in fact, nothing less than war against the government and people of the United States, that it formally accept the status of belligerent which has thus been thrust upon it, and that it take immediate steps, not only to put the country in a more thorough state of defense, but also to exert all its power and employ all its resources to bring the government of the German Empire to terms and end the war. What this will involve is clear. It will involve the utmost practical cooperation in counsel and action with the governments now at war with Germany, and, as incident to that, the extension to those governments of the most liberal financial credits in order that our resources may, so far as possible, be added to theirs. It will involve the organization and mobilization of all the material resources of the country to supply the materials of war and serve the incidental needs of the nation in the most abundant and yet the most economical and efficient way possible. It will involve the immediate full equipment of the Navy in all respects, but particularly in supplying it with the best means of dealing with enemy submarines. It will involve the immediate addition to the armed forces of the United States, already provided for by law in case of war, at least 500,000 men, who should, in my opinion, be chosen upon the principle of universal liability to service, and also the authorization of subsequent additional increments of equal force so soon as they may be needed and can be handled in training. It will involve also, of course, the granting of adequate credits to the government, sustained, I hope, so far as they can equitably be sustained by the present generation, by well-conceived taxation. I say sustained so far as may be equitable by taxation, because it seems to me that it would be most unwise to base the credits which will now be necessary entirely on money borrowed. It is our duty, I most respectfully urge, to protect our people, so far as we may, against the very serious hardships and evils which would be likely to arise out of the inflation which would be produced by vast loans. In carrying out the measures by which these things are to be accomplished, we should keep constantly in mind the wisdom of interfering as little as possible in our own preparation and in the equipment of our own military forces with the duty, for it will be a very practical duty, of supplying the nations already at war with Germany with the materials which they can obtain only from us or by our assistance. They are in the field, and we should help them in every way to be effective there. I shall take the liberty of suggesting, through the several executive departments of the government, for the consideration of your committees, measures for accomplishment of the several objects which I have mentioned. I hope that it will be your pleasure to deal with them as having been framed after very careful thought by the branch of the government upon which the responsibility of conducting the war and safeguarding the nation will most directly fall. While we do these things, these deeply momentous things, let us be very clear, and make very clear to all the world what our motives and our objects are. My own thought has not been driven from its habitual and normal course by the unhappy events of the last two months, and I do not believe that the thought of the nation has been altered or clouded by them. I have exactly the same things in mind now that I had in mind when I addressed the Senate on the 22nd of January last, the same that I had in mind when I addressed the Congress on the 3rd of February, and on the 26th of February. Our object now, as then, is to vindicate the principles of peace and justice in the life of the world as against selfish and autocratic power, and to set up among the really free and self-governed peoples of the world such a concert of purpose and of action as will henceforth ensure the observance of those principles. Neutrality is no longer feasible or desirable where the peace of the world is involved and the freedom of its peoples, and the menace to that peace and freedom lies in the existence of autocratic governments backed by organized force which is controlled wholly by their will, not by the will of their people. We have seen the last of neutrality in such circumstances. We are at the beginning of an age in which it will be insisted that the same standards of conduct and of responsibility for wrong done shall be observed among nations and their governments that are observed among the individual citizens of civilized states. We have no quarrel with the German people. We have no feeling toward them but one of sympathy and friendship. It was not upon their impulse that their government acted in entering this war. 
It was not with their previous knowledge or approval. It was a war determined upon as wars used to be determined upon in the old unhappy days, when peoples were nowhere consulted by their rulers, and wars were provoked and waged in the interest of dynasties or of little groups of ambitious men who were accustomed to use their fellow men as pawns and tools. Self-governed nations do not fill their neighbor's states with spies or set the course of intrigue to bring about some critical posture of affairs which will give them an opportunity to strike and make conquest. Such designs can be successfully worked out only under cover and where no one has the right to ask questions. Cunningly contrived plans of deception or aggression, carried, it may be, from generation to generation, can be worked out and kept from the light only within the privacy of courts or behind the carefully guarded confidences of a narrow and privileged class. They are happily impossible where public opinion commands and insists upon full information concerning all the nation's affairs. A steadfast concert for peace can never be maintained except by a partnership of democratic nations. No autocratic government could be trusted to keep faith within it or observe its covenants. It must be a league of honor, a partnership of opinion. Intrigue would eat its vitals away. The plottings of inner circles who could plan what they would and render account to no one would be a corruption seated at its very heart. Only free peoples can hold their purpose and their honor steady to a common end and prefer the interests of mankind to any narrow interest of their own. Does not every American feel that assurance has been added to our hope for the future peace of the world by the wonderful and heartening things that have been happening within the last few weeks in Russia? Russia was known by those who knew it best to have been always in fact democratic at heart, in all the vital habits of her thought, in all the intimate relationships of her people that spoke their natural instinct, their habitual attitude toward life. The autocracy that crowned the summit of her political structure, long as it had stood and terrible as was the reality of its power, was not in fact Russian in origin, character, or purpose. And now it has been shaken off, and the great, generous Russian people have been added in all their naive majesty and might to the forces that are fighting for freedom in the world, for justice, and for peace. Here is a fit partner for a League of Honor. One of the things that has served to convince us that the Prussian autocracy was not and could never be our friend is that from the very outset of the present war it has filled our unsuspecting communities and even our offices of government with spies and set criminal intrigues everywhere afoot against our national unity of counsel, our peace within and without, our industries and our commerce. Indeed, it is now evident that its spies were here even before the war began, and it is unhappily not a matter of conjecture, but a fact proved in our courts of justice, that the intrigues which have more than once come perilously near to disturbing the peace and dislocating the industries of the country have been carried on at the instigation, with the support, and even under the personal direction of official agents of the imperial government accredited to the government of the United States. Even in checking these things and trying to extirpate them, we have sought to put the most generous interpretation possible upon them because we knew that their source lay, not in any hostile feeling or purpose of the German people towards us, who were, no doubt, as ignorant of them as we ourselves were, but only in the selfish designs of a government that did what it pleased and told its people nothing. But they have played their part in serving to convince us at last that the government entertains no real friendship for us and means to act against our peace and security at its convenience that it means to stir up enemies against us at our very doors, the intercepted note to the German minister at Mexico City is eloquent evidence. We are accepting this challenge of hostile purpose because we know that in such a government, following such methods, we can never have a friend, and that in the presence of its organized power, always lying in wait to accomplish we know not what purpose, there can be no assured security for the democratic governments of the world. We are now about to accept gauge of battle with this natural foe to liberty, and shall, if necessary, spend the whole force of the nation to check and nullify its pretensions and its power. We are glad, now that we see the facts with no veil of false pretense about them, to fight thus for the ultimate peace of the world and for the liberation of its peoples, the German peoples included, for the rights of nations great and small, and the privilege of men everywhere to choose their way of life and of obedience. The world must be made safe for democracy. Its peace must be planted upon the tested foundations of political liberty. We have no selfish ends to serve. We desire no conquest, no dominion. We seek no indemnities for ourselves, no material compensation for the sacrifices we shall freely make. We are but one of the champions of the rights of mankind. 
we shall be satisfied when those rights have been made as secure as the faith and the freedom of nations can make them. Just because we fight without rancor and without selfish object, seeking nothing for ourselves but what we shall wish to share with all free peoples, we shall, I feel confident, conduct our operations as belligerents without passion, and ourselves observe with proud Pontilio the principles of right and a fair play we profess to be fighting for. I have said nothing of the governments allied with the imperial government of Germany, because they have not made war upon us or challenged us to defend our right and our honor. The Austro-Hungarian government has, indeed, avowed its unqualified endorsement and acceptance of the reckless and lawless submarine warfare adopted now without disguise by the imperial German government, and it has therefore not been possible for this government to receive Count Tarnowski, the ambassador recently accredited to this government by the imperial and royal government of Austria-Hungary. But that government has not actually engaged in warfare against citizens of the United States on the seas, and I take the liberty, for the present at least, of postponing a discussion of our relations with the authorities at Vienna. We enter into this war only where we are clearly forced into it, because there are no other means of defending our rights. It will be all the easier for us to conduct ourselves as belligerents in a high spirit of right and fairness, because we act without animus, not in enmity towards a people or with a desire to bring any injury or disadvantage upon them, but only in armed opposition to an irresponsible government which has thrown aside all considerations of humanity and of right and is running amuck. We are, let me say again, the sincere friends of the German people, and shall desire nothing so much as the early re-establishment of intimate relations of mutual advantage between us, however hard it may be for them, for the time being, to believe that this is spoken from our hearts. We have borne with their present government through all these bitter months because of that friendship, exercising a patience and forbearance which would otherwise have been impossible. We shall, happily, still have an opportunity to prove that friendship in our daily attitude and actions towards the millions of men and women of German birth and native sympathy who live amongst us and share our life, and we shall be proud to prove it towards all who are in fact loyal to their neighbors and to the government in the hour of test. They are, most of them, as true and loyal Americans as if they had never known any other fealty or allegiance. They will be prompt to stand with us in rebuking and restraining the few who may be of a different mind and purpose. If there should be disloyalty, it will be dealt with with a firm hand of stern repression. But, if it lifts its head at all, it will lift it only here and there, and without countenance except from a lawless and malignant few. It is a distressing and oppressive duty, gentlemen of the Congress, which I have performed in thus addressing you. There are, it may be, many months of fiery trial and sacrifice ahead of us. It is a fearful thing to lead this great peaceful people into war, into the most terrible and disastrous of all wars, civilization itself seeming to be in the balance. But the right is more precious than peace, and we shall fight for the things which we have always carried nearest our hearts, for democracy, for the right of those who submit to authority to have a voice in their own governments, for the rights and liberties of small nations, for a universal dominion of rights by such a concert of free people as shall bring peace and safety to all nations and make the world itself at last free. To such a task we can dedicate our lives and our fortunes, everything that we are and everything that we have, with the pride of those who know that the day has come when America is privileged to spend her blood and her might for the principles which gave her birth and happiness, and the peace which she has treasured. God helping her, she can do no other. End of section 90 Recording by Todd Section 91 of the World War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 15, The World War, edited by Horatio W. Dresser section ninety one with the americans at the front nineteen seventeen by george patullo at the urgent request of the french commission which visited the united states in april american troops were sent across earlier than had been intended 
the first contingent reaching france late in june before winter they were ready for their final training in the front trenches the editor toward the end of october the first american contingent seemed to be about as letter-perfect in their work as could reasonably be hoped there was even a danger that further application to the same training might make them stale they had come along in grand style physically boys whose blouses used to sag on them like a middy last summer were now bursting the chest buttons of the same uniforms and they had learned to perform like clockwork everything their instructors had taught them they were a pretty fine lot of soldiers as we used to know soldiers in those piping days of ease before nineteen fourteen but they were not yet fighting men it was to make them fighting men that general pershing put them into the front line with the french there is a vast difference between learning things in a training camp and doing them opposite an active enemy so the american commander planned to put the finishing touches on the first contingent by some work within reach of the boche guns to harden the men and teach them how to take care of themselves in trench warfare he selected a quiet sector for the purpose probably he could not have found a more reposeful sector in all europe his idea was to round out training with as little fuss as might be so that the men of the first contingent would be competent to instruct the green troops coming from america and as soon as all had been given the experience the battalions were withdrawn that is all there was to it the proceedings were devoid of fireworks the paris edition of an american newspaper solemnly announced that our forces had taken over a sector of the front during the dark hours of the night and that when dawn broke the astounded germans were apprised of the event by the spectacle of the stars and stripes floating proudly from our parapets but actually there was no moving picture stuff whatever the troops eased in with the french the more quietly it was done the better satisfied were the american and french commands they wanted no blare of bands and old glory on a front-line trench could wait until the trench was empty moving out of villages back of the line the companies marched along the roads leading to the communication trenches and arrived there went in to relieve the poilu in platoon groups it was very dark and the rain fell drearily about the only persons who saw this movement were a few french soldiers en repos in the villages some old men and women and a little girl in a cape who trotted along beside the marching column of one battalion talking to the intent silent men as they reached the crossroads where they turned to go along the canal she stopped and waved her hand at them for luck may heaven bless her here is a picture of the way you go in your experience will differ from this and the local setting and details when the time comes more especially if you happen to be hurried up to support battalions that are being strafed but in the ordinary course of events you will do it about the way the first contingent did it they have been keeping you back in a village during the training period sixty or seventy or ninety kilometres behind the front in plain sight is another village and there are american troops billeted there also everywhere you turn in this section of france you find them the roads and fields are full of khaki figures the streets of every hamlet swarm with them and there is a hamlet every two or three miles well they have gradually seasoned you by the hardest kind of work you are physically fit to tackle your weight in wild cats out on the training ground beyond the village you have practised every form of trench work and open warfare until you do it automatically at command and you have grown acclimated to your billet which used to be a storehouse with a hayloft in it no longer seems chilly when the temperature is at a raw damp fifty-five degrees or if you have been living in one of the frame barracks provided you don't begin to think of pneumonia every time the roof leaks or a cold wind comes tearing through a fissure in the wall in fact you're fit my boy fitter than you ever were in your life 
not even barring the proud day you made the eleven on a day your battalion receives orders to get ready to move perhaps you know what is coming off perhaps you don't at any rate that is none of your business all you've got to do is obey orders and keep your rifle clean so you hustle round pack your kit stall off abe green when he inquires whether you feel like paying back that twenty francs you borrowed and presently parade with the others in full marching order and your helmet on strapped to your back is the kit a full seventy pounds and more the official figures give the weight as something less but i have weighed a dozen of them in the kit you carry your bedding which consists of three blankets extra socks and extra shoes mess tins and emergency rations first-aid dressings ammunition everything you will require for a ten-day tour in the trenches with bayonet and pick and shovel the kit is a sizable load you bend forward as you march and if it doesn't sit snugly heaven help you long lines of motor trucks are in the road you pile into one of them and when all is ready the driver lights a cigarette says well we're off get up sarah and a moment later you go careering out of the village behind you comes another truck and another and another trucks are strung out as far as the eye can reach it isn't such a bad business bowling along a country road in france even in a motor truck the driver keeps his machine on the crown of the road and lets the automobiles that overtake him do the worrying the wild warning shrieks of their sirens seem to fill him with a holy joy a smile of infinite peace comes to his face as he holds the nose of the truck exactly in the middle you pass through a score of villages and toward dusk arrive at one which shows the scars of war the stark ribs of ruined houses stick up through piles of debris where a jack johnson landed is a jumbled mass of bricks and twisted metal and shattered stone that used to be the mairie you're in the fighting zone now but the trucks keep on and it is dark when you arrive at your destination everybody piles out and eases cramped legs you are in a tiny village and few people are stirring opposite you is a cafe called the cheval d'or through the window you make out the figures of seven poilus seated at a table drinking wine there is a wide old-fashioned fireplace at the end of the room and over it a woman is cooking supper on an andiron contrivance that holds a pan and two kettles the order is given to fall in the darkness deepens as you stand there in the road waiting for the command to move company attention thirty seconds later you are headed for the trenches of course it has begun to rain it falls with a steady dreary murmur the iron hard road is covered with a thin layer of mud deposited by the constant passage of trucks and wagons the rain drips sadly from the tall trees standing like gaunt sentinels on either side with your poncho hanging from your shoulders and your head bent under the load of your pack you tramp out of the village one of the boys tries to strike up a song silence barks an officer you turn a corner and follow a canal tramp 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 that and the rumble of the kitchens and machine guns are the only sounds some sparks fall from the swaying kitchens and dimly you discern the outlines of the mules pulling the little devils so dreaded by infantry behind them are more doughboys the column is lost in the night both ahead and behind you the man next to you is breathing hard and you wonder whether he is nervous but you don't ask him for it is your first time in and everybody is keyed up a red cross ambulance dashes up from nowhere and pulls out to give the marching column right of way its driver flashes on his lights an instant turn that out cries an officer and the blackness is worse than before you keep this up until the pack weighs about eleven hundred pounds and the man behind you is beginning to mutter doggone where are them trenches anyhow in rusha at last you are halted you can't see anything but the road under your feet and the outlines of some trees but the dark becomes peopled with strange shapes after a while your platoon is called to attention the remainder of the company stands at rest and before you can guess what's up you are marching along beside a hedge up a hill the going is slippery for you are on a dirt road you skirt an embankment from which come muffled voices a curtain lifts and then you discern that what you took for a blur 
is the entrance to a dugout a man in the doorway of the dugout says something to the platoon commander but you are already past him still uphill the mud is harder to shake than a book agent at last you reach comparatively level ground and march along beside more blurs you hear voices inside the blurs and occasionally see the tiniest streak of light but though you strain your eyes you cannot make out what the blurs are artillery dugouts i reckon huh someone whispers and the man in front of you stumbles zowie look out he warns and next moment you plunge blindly into an opening in the earth you are now in the communication trenches the mud is ankle deep and it gives you plenty to do to keep on your feet and not hold up the line no wonder they gave you all those hardening exercises this is a holy fright however you manage to hold the pace twisting and turning dipping downward feeling your way along the wall of the trench now you hit a stretch of duck boards and the walking is better you see nothing but a pale streak of sky when you lift your head stumbling blindly in the wake of the man in front and swallowing in silence your rage against the man behind when he walks on the calf of your leg about a million miles of this and the line halts there is whispering ahead of you now that you are used to the dark you descry other forms than those of your comrades in the trench a figure in a pale uniform pushes past you going out another and another follow they are the poilu your platoon is relieving the line moves slowly forward you pass a dugout then a dark opening from which a pair of legs protrudes evidently a frenchy has crawled into a funk hole to snatch a forgotten piece of property before he marches out it is your turn now you are the head of the line all the men in front of you have taken up their positions a french soldier standing close to a fire step moves back and you move into his place he doesn't speak to you and you don't speak to him you simply take over the spot he has held and give your comrades room to move along and so the relief goes forward standing there you wonder how far off the next man is presently comes an officer who shows you the entrance to a dugout and gives some whispered instructions as to what you shall do in case of bombardment then he leads you to a cavity in the wall of the trench where the reserve supply of ammunition and the rockets are kept you tell him you've got it all clear and he passes on once more you are standing on the fire step staring with smarting eyes into the dark a machine gun is chattering somewhere in the night and far away from the edge of the world comes a sullen muttering like a heavy surf on a seashore the big guns at verdun suddenly a flare goes up in front of you you catch a flashing vision of a valley and a bare slope and there right under your nose is a tangled mass of wire entirely filled with boche you let fly in two minutes you've emptied the chamber and then the sergeant arrives hotfoot to inquire what the blue blazes you are shooting at there's a bunch of boche out there in the wire you tell him in a voice you strive to hold steady those are posts man he replies in disgust cut that out you relax and mop your brow gee that was a close call and abruptly you experience a blessed relief from tension no matter if you did make a mistake you were on the job a dim realization of that all-important fact gives you confidence you settle down for the long night watch an officer approaches using a trench stick it is nothing but an ordinary cane with a steel point to help progress in the mud somehow the sight of him unarmed with nothing but that little stick gives you courage there cannot be much danger if he goes round with a cane thus you reason the officer's stick is one of the moral forces of trench warfare how's everything he queries feeling all right that's the boy we're all right now we're in there is the story of an entry into the trenches it's a lot different from what you've been dreaming n'est-ce pas but that is always the way the front is never like the mental picture you draw of it there wasn't a man of the first contingent who hadn't indulged in daydreams of what it would be like not one of them came within a mile of the reality what happened at the front is more or less familiar to the american public the boche immediately grew attentive he did not try anything very serious but his artillery showed activity in spasms and on the night of november two to three he put over a raid however the object sought by the american command was accomplished those battalions are fit for a crack at the boche any day 
what did we learn repeated the brigadier in answer to a query this they went in boys they came out veterans end of section ninety one this recording is in the public domain section ninety two of the world war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume fifteen the world war edited by horatio w dresser section ninety two the president defines america's war aims nineteen eighteen by woodrow wilson on january eighth nineteen eighteen president wilson delivered before congress a momentous speech on america's war aims intended principally to harden russia in her hour of peril his speech was endorsed alike by radicals and conservatives in allied countries and was of the utmost value in uniting men of all shades of opinion in the resolve to achieve a just democratic and lasting peace the first part of his speech dealt with the peace parleys then being held between the Teutonic powers and Russia. The latter and more important part follows. The Editor There is no confusion of counsel among the adversaries of the central powers, no uncertainty of principle, no vagueness of detail. The only secrecy of counsel, the only lack of fearless frankness, the only failure to make the definite statement of the objects of the war, lies with germany and her allies the issues of life and death hang upon these definitions no statesman who has the least conception of his responsibility ought for a moment to permit himself to continue this tragical and appalling outpouring of blood and treasure unless he is sure beyond a peradventure that the objects of the vital sacrifice are part and parcel of the very life of society and that the people for whom he speaks thinks them right and imperative as he does there is, moreover, a voice calling for these definitions of principle and of purpose which is, it seems to me, more thrilling and more compelling than any of the many moving voices of which the troubled air of the world is filled. It is the voice of the Russian people. They are prostrate and all but helpless, it would seem, before the grim power of Germany, which has hitherto known no relenting and no pity. Their power, apparently, is shattered, and yet their soul is not subservient. They will not yield either in principle or in action. Their conviction of what is right, of what it is humane and honorable for them to accept, has been stated with a frankness, a largeness of view, a generosity of spirit, and a universal human sympathy which must challenge the admiration of every friend of mankind. And they have refused to compound their ideals or desert others that they themselves may be safe. They call to us to say what it is that we desire, in what, if in anything, our purpose and our spirit differ from theirs. And I believe that the people of the United States would wish me to respond with utter simplicity and frankness. Whether their present leaders believe it or not, it is our heartfelt desire and hope that some way may be opened whereby we may be privileged to assist the people of Russia to attain their utmost hope of liberty and ordered peace. It will be our wish and purpose that the processes of peace, when they are begun, will be absolutely open, and that they shall involve and permit henceforth no secret understandings of any kind. The day of conquest and aggrandizement is gone by. So is also the day of secret covenants entered into in the interests of particular governments, and likely at some unlooked-for moment to upset the peace of the world. It is this happy fact, now clear to the view of every public man whose thoughts did not still linger in an age that is dead and gone, which makes it possible for every nation whose purposes are consistent with justice and the peace of the world to avow now or at any other time the objects it has in view. We entered this war because violations of right had occurred which touched us to the quick and made the life of our own people impossible unless they were corrected and the world secured once for all against their recurrence. What we demand in this war, therefore, is nothing peculiar to ourselves. It is that the world be made fit and safe to live in, and particularly that it be made safe for every peace-loving nation which, like our own, wishes to live its own life, determine its own institutions, 
be assured of justice and fair dealing by the other peoples of the world as against force and selfish aggression. All the peoples of the world are in effect partners in this interest, and for our own part we see very clearly that unless justice be done to others, it will not be done to us. The program of the world's peace, therefore, is our program, and that program, the only possible program as we see it, is this. 1. Open covenants of peace, openly arrived at, after which there shall be no private international understandings of any kind, but diplomacy shall proceed always frankly and in the public view. 2. Absolute freedom of navigation upon the seas, outside territorial waters, alike in peace and in war, except as the seas may be closed in whole or in part by international action for the enforcement of international covenants. 3. The removal, so far as possible, of all economic barriers and the establishment of an equality of trade conditions among all the nations consenting to the peace and associating themselves for its maintenance. 4. Adequate guarantees given and taken that national armaments will be reduced to the lowest point consistent with domestic safety. 5. A free, open-minded, and absolutely impartial adjustment of all colonial claims, based upon a strict observance of the principle that in determining all such questions of sovereignty, the interests of the population concerned must have equal weight with the equitable claims of the government whose title is to be determined. 6. The evacuation of all Russian territory and such a settlement of all questions affecting Russia, as will secure the best and freest cooperation of the other nations of the world in obtaining for her an unhampered and unembarrassed opportunity for the independent determination of her own political development and national policy, and assure her of a sincere welcome into the society of free nations under institutions of her own choosing, and, more than a welcome, assistance also of every kind that she may need and may herself desire. The treatment accorded Russia by her sister nations in the months to come will be the acid test of their good will, of their comprehension of her needs as distinguished from their own interests, and of their intelligent and unselfish sympathy. 7. Belgium, the whole world will agree, must be evacuated and restored without any attempt to limit the sovereignty which she enjoys in common with all other free nations. No other single act will serve as this will serve to restore confidence among the nations in the laws which they themselves set and determine for the government of their relations with one another. Without this healing act, the whole structure and validity of international law is forever impaired. 8. All French territory should be freed and the invaded portions restored, and the wrong done to France by Prussia in 1871 in the matter of Alsace-Lorraine which has unsettled the peace of the world for nearly fifty years, should be righted, in order that peace may once more be made secure in the interest of all. 9. A readjustment of the frontiers of Italy should be effected among clearly recognizable lines of nationality. 10. The peoples of Austria-Hungary, whose place among the nations we wish to see safeguarded and assured, should be accorded the freest opportunity of autonomous development. 11. Romania, Serbia, and Montenegro should be evacuated, occupied territories restored, Serbia accorded free and secure access to the sea, and the relations of the several Balkan states to one another determined by friendly counsel along historically established lines of allegiance and nationality, an international guarantee of the political and economic independence and territorial integrity of the several Balkan states should be entered into. 12. The Turkish portions of the present Ottoman Empire should be assured a secure sovereignty, but the other nationalities which are now under Turkish rule should be assured an undoubted security of life and an absolutely unmolested opportunity of autonomous development, and the Dardanelles should be permanently opened as a free passage to the ships and commerce of all nations, under international guarantees. 13. An independent Polish state should be erected, which should include the territories inhabited by indisputably Polish populations, which should be assured a free and secure access to the sea, and whose political and economic independence and territorial integrity should be guaranteed by international covenant. 14. A general association of nations must be formed under specific covenants for the purpose of affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small states alike. In regard to these essential rectifications of wrong and assertions of right, 
we feel ourselves to be intimate partners of all the government and peoples associated together against the imperialists. We cannot be separated in interest or divided in purpose. We stand together until the end. For such arrangements and covenants we are willing to fight and to continue to fight until they are achieved, but only because we wish the right to prevail and desire a just and stable peace, such as can be secured only by removing the chief provocations to war, which this program does remove. We have no jealousy of German greatness, and there is nothing in this program that impairs it. We grudge her no achievement or distinction or learning or pacific enterprise, such as have made her record very bright and very enviable. We do not wish to injure her, or to block in any way her legitimate influence or power. We do not wish to fight her either with arms or with hostile agreements of trade, if she is willing to associate herself with us and the other peace-loving nations of the world in covenants of justice and law and fair dealing. We wish her only to accept a place of equality among the peoples of the world, the new world in which we now live, instead of a place of mastery. Nor do we presume to suggest to her any alternation or modification of her institutions, but it is necessary, we must frankly say, and necessary as a preliminary to any intelligent dealings with her on our part, that we should know whom her spokesmen speak for when they speak to us, whether for the Reichstag majority, or for the military party, and the people whose creed is imperial domination. We have spoken now, surely in terms too concrete to admit of any further doubt or question. An evident principle runs through the whole program I have outlined. It is the principle of justice to all peoples and nationalities, and their right to live on equal terms of liberty and safety with one another, whether they be strong or weak. Unless this principle be made its foundations, no part of the structure of international justice can stand. The peoples of the United States could act upon no other principle, and to the vindication of this principle they are ready to devote their lives, their honor, and everything that they possess. The moral climax of this, the culminating and final war for human liberty, has come, and they are ready to put their own strength, their own highest purpose, their own integrity, and devotion to the test. End of section 92. Recording by Todd. End of the World Story, A History of the World in Story, Song, and Art. Volume 15, The World War. Edited by Horatio W. Dresser.